Thank you, Rosa. Um, so, um, Tanawa, um, I would like to begin with talking about these works on the wall, these paper works, mm -hmm. which are terotypes. Let's begin by talking for the benefit of the audience about how you made them, how mm -hmm. you um, came to these forms, these colors, textures. Mm. I mean, how exactly is the process? And then we can talk maybe about mm. why. Yeah. So the process in practical terms um, begins with plain newsprint. I decide on a geometric form, and around the time of beginning to develop this body of work, I was forced to work desk size after making a work that was four meters by three meters and was like a composite bound newsprint object representing a building. I then was without that sort of making space. So I was starting to work desk sized and that sort of decided the range of scales of the terotypes in this show. So once the plain newsprint forms are cut, um, 20 sheets is the sort of limit that I found that the needle on the sewing machine can push through without breaking. I then stain the sheets of newsprint with pigments that are typically foraged. This show revolved around foraged pigments in particular, the reasons behind which I guess we'll discuss maybe a bit later. Um, so once they're stained, I, so in, in the staining process, I guess it's important to note that there are always four layers on each sheet. So a base wash, a stenciled layer, and then two more washes. And I found again through experimenting that that led to this effect that felt really, that had a lot of depth in such a thin piece of paper, you got a lot of depth. Then the so, machine- Sorry, those four layers are with the same color? Same, same color. Same, yeah, okay. Yeah. Then once all those 20 sheets are stained, they're placed in a stack and a machine stitch is run around the perimeter to bind them all in a layer. The next process is taking that stack to a body of water, so either a river, sea, or a bog, in the case of this show, submerging that stack underwater for about half an hour so the water can really permeate the center. It takes a lot longer than you'd realize to saturate a work that's this small. Do you put stones on it or do you actually stay I like I, I, I quite like that every process is like my hand, uh -huh. either drawing, cutting, rubbing, stitching, tearing, or like plunging. So I really like to just keep them under mm -hmm. with my hands. And then they're removed, taken back to the studio and torn. And so at this stage, are they still a rectangle? Or is it, do you use a shape? I decide on a shape and just mark that out okay. at the beginning. That decides the sort of, the main Before form. Before you sew it, yeah. Yeah. So then when they're taken back to the studio, they're torn. And that's this moment where I try and remove, because it's quite neurotic. All the other stages are very precise, very neurotic, and very intentional in a way. So when I start tearing through, I try and have it be this like more emotional process where gesture is coming in and I guess thinking about things like action painting, which mm -hmm. like is intentional, but also kind of is letting go of control in a way. Mm -hmm. And then they're dried and that's it. Okay. And so at what point in that so these kind of fringes around mm. the edge, are they done with a knife? So the fringing, sorry, the fringing happens um, once they're all stitched in that stack before they're soaked. Okay. The, with scissors, okay. just hand cut. Yeah. As close as I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so having gone sort of straight into the middle of that process, let's step back then and talk about what was the genesis of this work and how did it end up being paper and being mm. these shapes and these pigments? Mm. So it's, a, it's a, gonna be a, another long sure. answer. Yeah. But let's say, yeah, first of all, where did you begin with stacking paper, why? So, I mean, do you mean like back, at, back when I was at Goldsmiths? Yeah. So that's when this process yes. began. Yeah. So it was a way simply to make a drawing more robust. 
and to potentially allow for a drawing on paper to be taken into an unpredictable climate and see what happens if you make this kind of ultimate drawing that can be bashed around by wind, fall and hit the ground, be soaked in rainwater. And yeah, it was like an, a material experiment to see how robust can you make a drawing, a simple drawing on paper, and then how far can you push that drawing. Because um, you could have used canvas. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah, I guess it's like reinforcing it with itself, mm -hmm. with its like own material quality. Um, so that was the first kind of impetus behind the layering and the stitching. Mm. But then moving throughout my development of working with, new, with stacked stitched newsprint, I realized I was wasting the potential of all of these layers, these 20 layers, because at first it was just the top layer mm. that I would draw on or pigment. And then my last solo show, A Tower to Say Goodbye, creating this work that was four meters by three, I thought, why don't I try and push through these layers so it becomes this thing of excavating layers of meaning mm. throughout this kind of ultimate drawing mm. type thing. So would you say there's an aspect of time or is it more kind of an archaeology of a sense of something destroyed or...? I feel like it's more like creating a record of something and that's where I suppose my interest in microchips and data stores, like electrical data stores, came in to this body of work because these have the ability to contain 20 geological records mm. of a place. So they are these stores of place data. The 20 mm. is decided by how far the needle can punch, but mm. then that allows for quite a varied amount of information to be worked into each layer. Mm. And as you go back, the colour changes, right? Mm. So that because, if I understood it right, you put the 20 together, you stitch them, then you stain it. No, 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 the staining happens before Individual the Individual sheets yep. are stained. Yep. Okay, so you, ch you make decisions yep. about yeah. whatever the concentration or the time. Yeah, but then I like to randomly order them in the stack. So then when I start the tearing, it's a surprise to see what I'm coming across because yeah. I sometimes forget what lies beneath. Yeah. So then it's an excavation sort of process. Yeah, yeah, because the feeling is that maybe something rotted and certain, yeah. Mm. I mean, when I'm giving away all your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I'm going to go and make some of these. Now. Um, so tell us a bit about the pigments now. Mm. Um, you have a connection to the to certain landscapes. I don't know if that's the ones that have been used for these works, mm. but I mean, earth colours I kind of understand. The blue is, I, I don't know, you know, mm. so maybe mm. talk us through. Yeah, so the, the grey and yellow terra type on the back wall there and the orange, grey and yellow one above here were both made, they were the first two that I made in this body of work and they were made on a residency in the Isle of Skye. Mm -hmm. I was there with my partner and um, we were there for a month and I wanted to create some works that were really site specific to the Isle of Skye. I'd been researching into the first tartan textiles and how they would be pigmented and how the color palette would represent a place or a community because mm -hmm. they would only be pre-synthesized pigments. They would only be dyed with berries, plants, or minerals local mm. to a community. So I thought it'd be exciting to try and create my own, yeah, like textile paper record mm. blend of the Isle of Skye. So I went foraging, just read a book on foraging and found this bevy of colors on the island that was so exciting mm. from yellows through oranges, reds, and purples. Mm. Um, so I like that, yeah, the color palette is restricted to what's available in the area. In some space, it might be totally muted because that is what the, the earth is sort of naturally producing to represent itself. Mm. And in the case of sky, there's a lot of iron, right? There's a lot of, yeah. in the peat. There it? are lots, a lot, a range of reds there. Yeah. I think we found 
yeah, like three different reds yeah. on Sky, which was interesting. Yeah. And the blue? So the blue is synthesized. Okay. That's an ultramarine. So from, well, it could be from lapis lazuli, but I think that's synthesized. I wanted to see what happened if I rubbed, uh, or I guess, yeah, it's like I placed a foraged earth tone against a, a synthesized pigment, but I wanted to see what would happen visually, that rubbing mm -hmm. up against each other of something that feels quite electric in mm -hmm. that blue. Mm -hmm. And I'm, what I'm interested in about that terratype blue gate, it's called, is how the blue feels like hotter to me in a way. Mm -hmm. It has this effect on like the back of your eye when you stare at it for a while, whereas the red is actually quite soft mm -hmm. and a bit colder. So it's like flipping the, the typical associations yes, yeah. with those two opposing colors. Yeah. I mean, I get the impression by listening to you and looking at these works and the different layers that they have and the meaning of the process, you know, this sort of meticulous process that you do, that there is a charge, like there's a sense of a charge. Mm. And some of the titles in this room are related to the idea of battery or, um, or monolith, which is also a kind of charged. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is that something that was, that's come into your work with this? Mm kind of yeah. stage or is it something that was there before? Or? Yeah, it's definitely new with this body of work. And again, starting in Sky, I was really struck by when I would go on hikes out there, it would just be like rock and hills and mud. And then suddenly you'd come across a power station mm. in the middle of the hills and you'd hear this humming of electricity emanating from it. And then I started to look at the pylons and the sort of geometry present in the pylons and the cables pulling taut in different directions. And then the glass and ceramic insulators that were on the pylons mm. to stop that electricity jumping down and injuring passers-by. Mm. So then it really got me thinking about electrical flow, man-made, man-harnessed electrical flow that's running through these spaces, but then this more spiritual charge that is present in the rock and humans' relationship to sort of flocking to like store or something, these huge pinnacles of rock mm. that are like some sort of, I don't know, mecca in a mm. sense mm -hmm. for hikers. Yeah, I mean, these uh, structures in the space, the lifts, um, certainly are reminiscent of a kind of timeless yet somehow futuristic sort of monolith. Mm. Um, also a little bit like doorways, aren't they? A little sort of to have the appearance of being portals or doorways. Yeah. And I think in some of the sort of things that I've read about this work, you've spoken about sci-fi. And I wanted to talk to you about this sort of meeting of something quite ancient in your work and something, and, and then these more technological processes like digital scanning and sort of mysterious kind of black object which we mm. relate to 2001 so is mm. can you talk a bit about the meeting let's say of, of technology which is modern or futuristic with ancient technology and why that lends itself to the idea of sci-fi mm. I mean it's a kind of difficult question but maybe. I suppose when you were speaking I was thinking about cinema uh -huh. and when I first visited this space that I knew I'd be taking on, it had this like cinematic quality to it. I like fantasized about what I might be able to do. And I was picturing these very like, yeah, it was like something grand and cinematic that it felt needed to create some sense of drama. Mm. And sci-fi films, particularly the ones that relate to space, I suppose, and like objects that might relate to outer space. I don't know, I'm thinking of a film like Interstellar, for example, and just like darkness and like objects floating in darkness or even mm -hmm. Star Wars or something. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something that I find just quite profound about like deep black and like a glowing object in that sort of space. And um, yeah, I suppose thinking about outer space, for example, it has this future 
quality to it because of the way it's represented in cinema. It's always something about going beyond mm. or like journeying to some future possibility, but it's the most ancient yeah. space that exists. Right. In fact, what we see now is what's kind of being played back from yeah. a long time ago isn't yeah. it, in terms of Yeah, this feedback and, loop yeah. of like, yeah, viewing things from this mm -hmm. strange temporal distance, which is mm. like, un, you can't really fathom it. Mm. So these, I mean, for the, yeah, for people who've just sort of arrived in this space, these images, talk us through those, how they're made. Mm. So the liths, um, they're, they're double-sided for people that haven't seen the show yet. So there's a photographic print on each side of the box. And the images are enlarged printed scans of shards of paper that have been torn away from the terotypes in the room. So each one is lifted from a terotype that's on the wall. So I like that they're both, because of their scale in relation to the terotypes, they appear like progenitors, some sort of like parent figure, but mm. they're actually in a way the kind of offspring mm. of the terotypes and continue and enlarge this um, geometric pattern that is present in all of the objects in the show. So they're digitally scanned. Yeah little pieces, of, I mean, what? Yeah, so they're around maybe like 20 centimeters max mm. high and about five centimeters wide I mean, with they, the original objects. They look, I mean, I'm looking at particularly this one because it's sort of floating. They're all floating, actually. They, mm. they have the impression, they give the impression of somehow being projected rather than physically yeah. in the space. Um, and they have this sort of strange aspect of scale to them where you're not quite sure. I mean, when I first saw this work, it was in an image, and I thought you'd actually stuck bits of mm. newsprint to the image. Mm. So why is Tana was sending me this <laughs> strange image of where she's... Um, they, they have, yeah, they have a sort of kind of retro feeling to them. And I don't mm. know if that is because of the black, ground in a way I don't know but there is something mm. around time travel I feel in this show in general mm. and that mm. time travel kind of mm. the way that looks the aesthetic of the time travel it's lending itself maybe to a sort of earlier era mm. what um, era are you thinking of well I'm just yeah to 70s, maybe. I was going to say yeah. that's what was coming to mind. Like yeah. Star Trek? Is yeah. that why? That Not they're... really Star Trek, no, because I'm thinking I'm, you know, I'm going, I'm aiming higher, but um, definitely aiming higher. <laughs> but I, I feel like, yeah, there's a sort of, maybe it's not the works themselves, but the sort of idea of something out there, the sort of the attempt in your work, in this work, I think that there's some element of, I mean, I wrote down here, worship, because I think that's because mm -hmm. when I was looking at the images, I saw them as sort of like Stonehenge scale, which they are. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe not, but you know, they're big. Yeah. And, um, and seeming to sort of ask you to venerate them because they're one little piece of paper that's been blown mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and it looks like mm -hmm. maybe they were found in a bog. Mm. You know, mm. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> there's this, there's an aspect of a sort of potential for yeah pilgrimage or, or worship in this work, and I don't know if that is an aesthetic that you're interested in, or if that is a sort of I think it's more like a sensation, like trying to replicate something that I experienced for the first time on that trip to Skye, which was a sense of spirituality, mm. like a genuine one. Like I'd never experienced a sense of feeling spiritual or like connected to anything that was higher than the human experience before. And I was very struck by that. And mm -hmm. I think it was going to store in the mist mm. on our first day there. It was just this amazing opening act to that So did month. you feel it was a connection with the landscape or a connection with more like the universe. Yeah, yeah. I think so. 
And I think that kind of, yeah, like the pinnacles of rock, like shooting upwards and like disappearing in the mist and then emerging mm. again. It definitely felt like something, yeah, like, I guess it's quite humbling mm. being stood before something that big. That, that amount of time as yeah. well. Were, yeah. yeah. As in like how old you mean yeah, the rock yeah, is. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, and I think the, the sort of portal and like you said, said retro, but I suppose I think of going back in some way, but more to my childhood mm. and time spent on Dartmoor, which was the impetus for me engaging with the British rural at all in my practice. Um, this body of work and showing it in Bristol has been an opportunity for me to go back to Devon and engage in a way which feels safe mm. and new. Mm. Um, so this idea of being able to step through mm. is, is maybe a subconscious way of like speaking to that as well, that act that I went through mm. and kind of returning to these landscapes and not feeling scared anymore of the memories that it brought up yeah. from growing up in Plymouth. Before I ask you the next question that I have on my notes, actually, I wanted to talk a bit about the other work that's in the show. I don't know if anyone can see this small kind of relief sculptures on the wall um, called, well, as a group, they're cells, but each have a different name. Yeah, wet cells and dry cells. Um, and they're titled based on the sort of terrain in which the stones that are embedded in them were foraged from. So some were foraged from by a riverbed or by the sea or up in a hill. So wet or dry mm. based on that mm -hmm. sort of location or proximity to the water. So they are small bronzes mm -hmm. with uh, kind of corrugated. Mm -hmm. Three of them are black and one is sort of silver. Yeah. And they have these stones embedded in them which have a really strong kind of deep colour to them. Yeah. Um, and when I was looking with you at the show earlier, we spoke about this kind of corrugation, these lines. Mm. And that brings us back a bit to thinking, I can't see it here. It's that left there. Yeah, the audience can't see that, but maybe on this one, can you see there's some sort of faint lines in the yellow? Horizontal yeah. lines. Horizontal lines. It's kind of like a, well, it's a sort of printing register, let's yeah. say, or, or of, um, inkjet printing. Yeah. So I'm giving the answer to, I can't really ask, <laughs> ask you a question really, but well, I guess, explain yeah. to me this. <laughs> well, um, I'm in, I, I wanted to keep, I, cause these, the shards of paper that were enlarged into the lists, like the stones that are embedded in the cells were, cause I, I have like hundreds of shards of paper that I go through and I discard obviously most of them, but these, um, I guess 10, I kept, all these five, because it's a scan of each side okay. of one shard, yeah. I kept because they felt special in some way. And I really liked the ones that had the lines on them because it was this accidental pattern that the printer arm had made. And I referenced the artist Wade Guyton when we were chatting earlier. Mm. And I was thinking about his work and his use of the inkjet printer a lot towards the end of this body of work. Um, and now he has one printer for cleaner printing, for more just saturating with no discrepancies, right. and one which he like tugs about and pushes yeah. to its limit. Yeah. So these accidents can happen, I guess. It's giving, it's personifying the machine in a way and letting those sort of mistakes live on. Mm. Um, and yeah, this is the first time I've worked with digital processes, so I kind of wanted to show that, in a sense, yeah. by having a, a mechanical mistake yeah. present. But it's interesting the kind of transitions it's gone through from this kind of newsprint in which you have this, I don't know what you called it, this stenciled yeah. pattern, which is stepped, yeah. to this pattern which came through an accidental printing mm. error, let's say. Yeah to then deliberately imprinting those lines onto the clay that you then cast in bronze. Yeah, and then also embossing that same pattern into some of the terotypes as well. And some of them, rather yeah. than being stenciled, are embossed with that pattern, okay. which is what you see here. That's why it looks raised, because it's yeah. a scan of an embossed shard. Right. 
So there's a sense of going back and forth and then in, some, in the process, at mm. which point you're gaining mm. while you're losing in a sense. Yeah, I yeah. Feel like. Yeah, and I suppose that was a way to keep reminding myself that I want this to feel like a circuit and like a continuous electrical flow. It's like an open circuit. It like breaks and oscillates in certain places and enlarges and like con constricts. Mm. Um, and yeah, I suppose in this body of work, I wanted to push paper as far as it could go, but I also wanted to push, I suppose, yeah, like print making in a way as well, like mm. as far as I could within these, the realm of these objects. Um, so yeah, it's like a process heavy show mm -hmm. and process is something I became more interested in during the lockdown when I just had time just to experiment in my room and just got really into process and mm. that was the driver for a mm. lot of my sculptural work. It's interesting because it's process heavy but I don't get the sense of looking at it of oh gosh this artist spent you know six months making this mm. you know it hasn't got that painstaking mm elements mm. still feels like there's an element of speed okay is that important to you do you think like that yeah with the lifts defi definitely because I'd been working away on the terror types quite meticulously and then myself Robert and Rosa had a discussion it was like we need something big we need something to like reach up mm. and really like grip on to the space mm. rather than it being this like yeah like salon Little hang type walls, thing yeah so I thought, well, what can I, how can I swipe upwards? Mm. And then I found the scanner and I was like, it is this action mm. of just like kind of wiping over an object. Yeah. And then the printing is again kind of like, I guess it's like wiping it down. And it was actually like a surprisingly simple way to achieve a powerful kind of more dominating mm. object. Yeah, it's nice how there are different times, actually, in the show. Mm. And that idea of reading across. Because when I look at your terror types and I look at um, these lifts, when I see the lines as well, I think of weaving. And there's no, you know, there isn't, there's a bit of sewing. There isn't really any weaving in the show, but it mm. all seems to speak about weaving. And in mm. a way, weaving to me is kind of, is about time. Yeah. It's about how things kind of grow together and are connected. And I suppose language, like early, they were like stores of language and like sometimes like stories or even sheet, like early sheet music was woven into like Gane and Kente cloth. Mm -hmm. For example, they were these early documents that had far more than a decorative purpose in ancient culture. So yeah, I think allowing textile to be more than just like crafts mm. for it to have more of a kind of logic or like active use like I feel like the terror types they they can be seen as decorative by some people like I've heard that comment but I actually think they are like functional as well and that they are these records of a place and a time mm. so you see them as being readable then yeah yeah and is it a sort of divination kind of reading or is it more of a Historical reading. Historical, like sentimental, I guess. Like they are very sentimental to me yeah. as well. So just one more sort of maybe bit of um, thinking around the cells. Um, again, the scale is, is kind of jumped. I don't know if I'm right, but I'm now I'm getting, because maybe because the order we spoke about it, the terotypes, then the lifts, then the cells. Yeah. So you sort of, jump back down into yeah. this very hard substance which is bronze and very compact mm, mm, yeah yeah um i suppose the so the cells i think of as like the activating buttons for the circuit in the room and it took a while to figure out what they should look like or what their form should read as so actually the idea came before the form with those yeah, yeah, it did. Um, yeah, because I knew I wanted this show to be a circuit of some sort, and I was just picturing like old, um, yeah, like mummy films, like set in ancient Egypt, and like trap doors and like stone buttons, mm. and these ancient like mechanical mm. components of some sort, and wanted to create something that gave a sense that if it was pushed on the gallery wall, 
it could activate something mm. in the space. So then, yeah, having them hand-sized then made sense for the scale. And they also have a, another aspect to my mind of chance, which is there's a lot of chance in this, in that my immediate thought when I looked at them was about stones being caught in the tread of a trainer because mm. they're bronze, but because they're black and they're corrugated, they look a bit like rubber, yeah. and then there's this stone stuck. Yeah. You sort of feel like this, like, object is yeah. kind of... yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of, there's a part, I mean, there's a sort of, I guess it feels like there is a part of this which is really, could be nothing, you know, and that's kind of important as well. It could be a stone stuck in your shoe mm. or it could be a switch to a, mm. Mm. To a secret. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I was saying to you earlier, it's funny that you mentioned that because the image of the stone stuck in the tread of a boot was like an early sketch I'd made before making any objects for the show. And I'd totally forgotten about it, but then you picked up on it today. And yeah, it's that element of chance of like hiking along and just like the rubber of a boot imprinting yeah. and plucking up the stone and then you've taken it home with you. And you've got and some pigment on your carpet yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, are we still okay for time? Yeah. So. Tanoa, when you were at Goldsmiths, and that's when um, I was talking to you on a regular basis there, um, the work you were making at that time was often directly addressing race and sexuality in terms of where you're coming from and who you are. Um, and I guess the work that you made after Goldsmiths, OP, Piero, sorry, yeah, yeah. was also um, addressing those subjects. Mm. Mm. And they're both film works. Mm -hmm. um, and here, I mean, this, this work is still actually very much about who you are, but in a less direct way. Mm. Do you think that that way of working with film kind of necessarily led you to that sort of more direct expression? Is it something that you would be interested in doing now or mm. is it something that you feel mm. is kind of kind? Yeah, I think when I was at Goldsmiths and afterwards, the work I was making after I graduated, I was definitely feeling a pressure to speak directly to black identity because typically on a fine art course, you're one of the maybe like five black students. Mm -hmm. So if that conversation about race is in the zeitgeist, which it was, it seemed to be like when I joined Goldsmiths in 2015, suddenly people wanted to talk about anti-black racism mm. and make some motions towards the conversation being, I don't know if at the time it was more nuanced, but at least people wanted to talk. Um, so I felt like I was being expected to provide like a platform or like a theater in my crits mm. for that conversation to happen through the work I was making. Mm. And like people would have been a bit confused if I wasn't making work about black identity right. directly. Um, and yeah, I mean, film, I was inspired to start making films because of your work and your film practice. And mainly being able to use analog film and looking at the way that you captured just smaller elements of human experience or human interaction or relationships, I thought was really interesting and inspiring. But I did find myself suddenly putting myself in front of the camera, mm. which wasn't necessarily intentional. I mean, mm. in Wapcore Baby, it definitely wasn't intentional. It was because right, the flags kept breaking. it was literally an breaking. accident of what happened. Yeah, yeah. and then getting accepted onto the new Flesh residency and having the opportunity to make costume and not having a massive budget. Well, I thought, well, I have to act again. I have to be the performer wearing the costume um, for the story I wanted to tell. So it was kind of accidental both times. And I was just, yeah, feeling frustrated with how I was being spoken to about my practice in that way. The questions I was being asked felt like they were just, they weren't serving me. Mm. Um, it was this, I guess, typical like quota filling exercise for people. 
So yeah, again, it was like during the lockdown, lockdown that I realized no one's expecting anything of me work-wise. Let me take a break from film because I can't really make film right now. Go back to drawing, go back to sculpture. And that sort of thinking has ended up here. Mm. But then, funnily enough, I feel really ready now to go back to film mm, okay. at some point. And um, myself and my partner have written a screenplay and I definitely don't want to act in it, but I would like to represent myself through an actor yeah. in that film. Because you are very much at the centre of your practice. Yeah, definitely. And would you, would you then consider this work as abstract? Or is that a, a word that doesn't even interest... It, does that word interest you? Is it, do we have mm. to sort of say whether something's abstract or not? Yeah, I guess maybe at the beginning of this body of work I would have said it is abstract and I really wanted it to be and I was interested in abstraction through geometry but now yeah maybe I don't feel like it needs to be quantified in that way because yeah the body is really present mm. in a lot of these works and the records of sort of physical performance and the tearing is very present um some of these are human sized or like mm -hmm. just higher. Some of the lists, it feels like you could walk through them and it would make sense in terms of the human body. And the cells are sort of hand sized. Again, these sort of like buttons that could be pushed or like handheld, like a mm -hmm. phone size, some sort of like dashboard type thing. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not really sure what sort of genre of like, art historical category these this show or these works would fall into but yeah maybe abstraction isn't so important mm. anymore in the way I think about them mm. I mean there's something when I think of um, a kind of again 70s sort of conceptual work where you would have something represented maybe through photography and, and then in a in another format like drawn you know there's a mm. sense of looking at representation right. perhaps in this as well i mm. mean it, i suppose you could also say there is no such thing as abstraction if because everything you know could say yes it's abstract but the ripping is like relating to the body or the side i mean then yeah. there is no such thing as abstraction sure. right because everything is relating to something yeah. but i feel that yeah there's a sense of um a process which you look at in various through various different filters mm, right mm. so yeah it's like even looking at the horse through oh, we didn't talk about the horse. yeah i can quickly say something yeah now. say something about the horse um so there's a body of terror types in the show that are all on this wall here and then finishing on that back wall that were inspired they were all made using north and south devon foraged pigments and then they were soaked in a bog on Dartmoor as his final process. And the forms, which are quite different to the terror types in the rest of the show, began as this sort of geometric rendering of a horse's head. Mm -hmm. I was interested in honoring this image of the horse in the show in some form, because a formative experience I had on Dartmoor as a teenager was falling into a bog in the mist and coming face to face with a horse that died in the bog whose head was just above the surface and I remember like seeing its brain and it being mm. very shocking um, and it was the first example to me that things die alone mm. out here and it's a place it's sort of like a postcard landscape but it's also quite cruel yeah. in the most like necessary way for just these life cycles to exist um, yeah, so, it w but I wanted the horse to also be part of this circuit, so like broken down into these quite hard geometric forms that would continue this flow. So I guess representing that life cycle of like death and life mm. and them all being components that fit together in the circuit mm. was the reason behind abstracting that horse. It would have been strange to render it in like a soft figurative yeah, it was interesting because when you tell the story, it almost sounds like 
sort of Wuthering Heights. It's very gothic. Well, Hound, Hound of the Baskervilles yeah. is where I saw it represented years later. Right, A yeah. horse is drowning yeah. in Dartmoor bogs. So, but there isn't that sense of necessarily melodrama or gothic in, in this work. Mm. Yeah, the kind of, I suppose, the, the melodrama is maybe more found in the lists, the sort of like dark yeah. sinking of yeah. like black and an object kind of floating mm. in the middle. But um, on some of the horse parts, you see plant matter sort of gnarled around the thread and sort of tips of the, the geometry on them. So hopefully that gives this sense of like, like almost like something fungal, like growing mm. out of it, which I think feels quite different to these. Yeah. Okay, I think it's time to open up to any questions that may be coming from the audience. Thank you for the talk, um, very informative. I've got a question. Um, as an artist at the moment, who do you think, uh, which thinkers are you um, allowing yourself to be uh, influenced by or who out there are you looking at that is kind of on your wavelength? Can mm -hmm. you give us a, a guide of the landscape? Funnily, the way that we met was by the shared interest, as in you and I were staff of the shared interest in um, Federico Campagna's writings. I've been lucky enough to have him as a critical theory lecturer at the Royal Academy. And um, his lectures and ideas around the metaverse and things moving beyond the realm of human perception, which were kind of trapped or were limited to, in a sense. Um, and thinking about how, yeah, I suppose that's led me to think about how many different forms can these objects and these materials be represented in, both in the form of a terotype or a lith or a battery. Um, and then the, I suppose the space in between, um, some of the visitor assistants here have expressed how they feel that there's this kind of charged liminal space between some of the objects in here, particularly between these four liths. Um, and I found a couple of people saying that they find this really strong kind of intangible sense from just spending time in the middle of these. And that was definitely really exciting for me to kind of, yeah, achieve something of a beginning of things that Federico talks about and encourages us as students to sort of strive to create in our work. Um, yeah, in terms of like a, a philosopher of sorts, he's, he's the one that comes to mind because I get to see him on a regular basis. Thank you both so much for a really fascinating talk. Um, Tanawa, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the kind of um, earthy connotations of the work and thinking about the frameworks in which your work um, might be Rep presented or represented kind of now or in future and thinking about one of the things that hasn't maybe come up so far um, is the kind of use of the land and use of abuses uh, and use and abuses of the land and whether or not that's something that you're also thinking about in terms of trying to kind of you know return to nature and engage with natural pigments and kind of mm. natural processes and this relationship to the body and of course you've touched on this kind of uh, kind of loose forms of mechanization or digitization but it feels like there's another thing maybe going on in the background of all that which is kind of about um exploitation and extraction and mm. those kinds of issues yeah um yeah i mean this body of work and because there was one terotype that was shown at goldsmith cca prior to the show opening and it was really interesting to see my work talked about in the context of like conservation or like ecological concerns. And um, I suppose, yeah, my use of pigment foraging, there's in lots of pigment foraging guides, there's, there are, there's always a section on kind of like conscious foraging and like not disrupting the earth too much, not taking too much pigment and also not disturbing sort of wildlife or like insects that might live amongst these sort of blocks of pigment in the ground. Um, so I do like to imagine that the terotypes can work in terms of like a, uh, 
a call for conservation of landscapes like Dartmoor, which are very sentimental for me. Um, but then it's also interesting because I've found that lots of old mines where there's been intense kind of aggressive digging and extraction in the sort of in the craters where that mining has occurred or in old sort of adits where waste would run out, they're a really rich source of pigment. Um, so that's, it's sort of like presents this idea of the earth being able to in some ways regenerate or damaging waste, being able to be extracted, extracted and turned into art materials particularly in the States, I, I was watching a, a short documentary on there are groups of people that specifically go to these old, really toxic waste mines and extract all of the iron oxide and turn it into pigment. So, yeah, I suppose it's taught me the ways in which my practice can contribute to that in terms of conservation as well as being a call for it. Um, in terms of the work speaking about like abuse of land, I suppose to me it doesn't consciously, like I could see how electrical components and thinking about, for example in Ghana, these like dumps that are full of old components of electrical waste, these like electrical graveyards. Someone at Spike actually mentioned that she saw a link between the two, but I suppose I see electrical components like microchips as like these quite beautiful objects actually in the way that they're created. They are created by artists through stenciled layers of information highways. And um, yeah, there's something that I find quite beautiful about them formally and in terms of their function and how that links to the human brain and memory. Um, yeah, there is yeah. a sense of the connection of the re repetition of patterns or images through yeah. different forms, with if you, the sort of neural pathways in the brain, the pathways in a circuit mm. or in a microchip. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know. Yeah. Get, you know, I don't know much about microchips actually. <laughs> Although my dad invented a kind of silicon chip. Really. Sophie's granddad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to ask him about it. Yeah, because these stenciled artworks would be scanned and then reduced and engraved onto silicon, which obviously comes from sand. It's like fired sand. Um, so there's a sense of a real looping in time. Yeah, yeah. Hi there, yeah. Brilliant talk, no, it's really interesting. I just want to ask, because you touched a bit at the beginning on your creative process. Um, how long did this take you from like start to finish, from like the creation of it to like actually like finishing this work? How long did it take you? Was it a meticulous thing or was it kind of loose? Like um, this body of work took 11 months, I think, to produce, and it was pretty non-stop. But um, once an individual terotype is started, I would say it's probably two weeks until I consider it finished. Um, because that normally involves leaving my London studio and getting trains or driving to rural landscapes, whether that's in Scotland or Devon. So, yeah, there are definitely, it's not constant, exciting gestural making. There are lots of periods, and it was a struggle at times during this, the making of this show, where I just felt like, am I just, like, completing to-do lists? And, like, how far is it right to continue the act of repetition in art making? Like, is there something to be found in like the recesses of what you think the outcome is gonna be? Or is it just going through the motions and creating to kind of m produce work for a show? And like, this has been my first experience of making a body of work for a sculpture show. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was definitely challenging in like finding that rhythm and finding a way that works for me to create this, um, this amount of work. There's so much faith that goes into that process, right? So the flip side of that is obviously doubt yeah. as well. Yeah. So when you're describing that, I can imagine this feeling of, I've got to do this, but am I just being busy? Am yeah. I, you know, yeah. and you also spoke earlier and just now about Wade Geisen, mm. 
who kind of has a process-based work, but it's a rather fast process, I imagine. I mean, I don't, he may also take a long time, but mm. he, he uses the printer to kind of make works. Mm. And you also have that speed yeah. sometimes in your work. Yeah. So do you feel like you, you want to keep alternating or do you think where yeah. you're going with this? Yeah. In terms I, of speeds of making. I definitely like the idea also being able to like immediately render an image like a screen print or something. Obviously there's construction that goes into creating the form that goes on the screen, but this idea of just like genesis immediately of an image, I think is now feeling more exciting to me than this kind of meticulous construction of something like a terotype just as a way to kind of push my sculpture practice forward. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa.